The title of this first lecture is In Directions, Getting Lost in Literature. Along with Homer's Iliad, the Odyssey is often considered a foundational text in Western literature. The story is a simple one. It's about one man's homecoming subsequent to a 10-year war. In Greek, the language in which this text was composed, the word homecoming is nostos. Nostos is the basis for the present day English word nostalgia. But the Odyssey is much more than that. It's also a story with shipwrecks, sexy goddesses, magic, and strange beasts. So when the text opens, we are confronted with something of a beautiful mess. And this beautiful mess is intellectually interesting as it raises many questions. One of the biggest questions it raises is concerning the relationship between life and literature. Is either the story of a direct trajectory between points A and B, or do we hang in there because of the beautiful masks and the squiggly lines and uncertain paths that take us between those two points? More to the point in this case, things are off track, but that's where stories come from. This unplanned moment, Odysseus's homecoming that goes awry, someday will make for a good story. From Homer's work, the word Odyssey has become synonymous with a long voyage marked by several adventures. But really, it's so called for its title character, Odysseus, whose name means child of anger. But who was Odysseus? Well, he was the legendary Greek king of Ithaca who endured a long, strange trip in order to make it back home. He was away fighting the Trojan War, which is the story told in Homer's Iliad. He's away for 10 years at that war, and it takes him a full 10 years to return from it. Let's see how we meet him in the first book of the Odyssey. At its very opening, the poet speaks directly to a muse. Who were the muses? So a muse was one of the nine daughters of Zeus and Mnemosyne, the goddess of memory. You are perhaps familiar with Mnemosyne, whether you realize it or not. If uh, you come up with a mnemonic device for memorizing something for, let's say, a test, uh, this derives from this word for, for memory. So uh, an example of that is the word Holmes, H-O-M-E-S, uh, the five letters in that standing for the, uh, uh, the Great Lakes here in our very own Midwest. So uh, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. See, I hadn't thought about that since I was uh, about 11 years old, but remembered them because of that mnemonic device. Um, the thinking here is that um, all of the arts in some kind of way uh, were a form of cultural memory. So this is really well demonstrated in the Odyssey where, um, of course, the art that uh, we're witnessing is, is poetry. Uh, but it's also a, a venue of, and a vehicle for telling stories about the past. So you'll notice um, a lot of characters don't really have um, dialogic exchanges with other characters in the way that, you know, we normally converse with people. Um, they talk by telling really long stories about things that have happened. By opening his story with an invocation of the muse, the poet calls attention to this work as a, a piece of art, as a story. The very first line of the poem, The Odyssey, the reader is really thrown into the deep end, as it were. Uh, it begins, tell me about a complicated man. So this is the poet uh, speaking to the muse, uh, to 
discover more about a complicated man. So what that means uh, really is anybody's guess at this point, but we will soon learn. Spoiler alert, that complicated man is Odysseus. Next, we get a little bit more information to you know, pixelate out this complicated man. The poet tells us he had wrecked the holy town of Troy. So what does that mean? This quote unquote wreckage that took place at the town of Troy is the subject of the Iliad, also attributed to Homer, the quote unquote prequel to the Odyssey. It is about a mythological 10 year war between the Greeks and the Trojans over the abduction of a woman named Helen, uh, who is Greek Helen of Sparta by a man named Paris, who is uh, of Troy. Even our backstories have backstories. So how is it that Paris uh, took it upon himself to abduct Helen of Troy, who was known to be the most beautiful woman in the world? Well, uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love, awarded Helen to Paris after the quote unquote judgment of Paris, where he was put in a rather awkward situation. He had to judge a beauty pageant between three goddesses. So one of them was Hera, Zeus's wife, so queen of all of the gods and goddesses. Athena, who makes an appearance in our text and is in fact a very major figure. She is uh, the goddess of wisdom among other things and Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love. Uh, so let's look at a tiny clue here in this picture that is instrumental to the judgment of Paris. More about that apple in one second. The apple had been brought to a wedding feast by the goddess Eris. She had not been invited to the, the wedding feast she was the goddess of discord, so it was thought that she would ruin the party, and she did, uh, brings this golden apple uh, to the feast, and on it, it says, for the fairest. So, yeah, what could go wrong there when you bring a gift like that to a wedding feast that is full of uh, beautiful gods and goddesses? Paris's abduction of Helen, uh, kicks off the Trojan War, and we might say, well, actually the goddess Eris who brought the golden apple to the feast is the one who instigated all of it. Um, those details of the mythological Trojan War are perhaps familiar to you. If you know one other thing about the Trojan War, you'll know what this is. So this is the wooden horse by which the Greeks penetrated the city of Troy. So we can see there it uh, is an enormous horse, and there's some soldiers climbing up into it. Uh, a scene famously parodied in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And it was, in fact, our friend Odysseus, uh, the complicated man uh, whose tale we're going to read in the Odyssey. He came up with the winning idea to defeat the Trojans. Uh, and perhaps you have heard of the turn of phrase, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. So, uh, gee, if your enemy is offering you a gift, uh, you might want to make sure they have a receipt uh, so you can you know, bring it back to the store. Um, I will mention briefly here that the theme of hospitality is something that we're going to want to pay attention to, especially in the brace of readings that we'll be doing for next week, right in the middle of uh, the book. We know about Odysseus's backstory and how he came to wander for so many years. He uh, was a warrior who fought in the Trojan War. But what else do we learn about him in the poet's invocation of the muse? And right now I'm speaking to the very uh, first few lines of the poem. We learn that his men ate the sun god's cattle. So as you'll see, as we get deeper into the book, they are starving and uh, you really need something to eat, but they've been expressly warned not to mess with these uh, cattle and their doing so has dire consequences uh, for them as well as for Odysseus. In order to appease the sun god, Zeus zaps their ship and 
uh, Odysseus is the only survivor left after this travesty. He winds up imprisoned on the island of a beautiful witch named Calypso, where he is stuck for seven years. Uh, so here Calypso gives him the gift of hospitality, uh, you know, but after maybe the first week or so, uh, many of us would get homesick and we will see that Odysseus likewise does. So is it that he's experiencing a bit uh, you know, too much of a good thing, as they say? So what does the poet ask of the muse? And I'm going to read the first 11 lines, uh, pausing in particular over uh, what is said in lines 10 and 11. The text reads, Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy, and where he went, and who he met, the pain he suffered on the sea, and how he worked to save his life and bring his men back home. He failed, and for their own mistakes they died. They ate the sun god's cattle, and the god kept them from home. Now, goddess, child of Zeus, tell this old story for our modern times. Find the beginning. So to my point about the poem being a beautiful mess, um, the poet is asking the muse, yeah, help me sort out this you know, ratty ball of yarn. Help me find the beginning of this story. What is my point of entry uh, into it? Because it's a long and involved story. Uh, even though it uh, entails a journey, it isn't so simple as movement between A and B. He also says, tell the old story for our modern times. So for those of you who picked up on that, uh, maybe you've chuckled to yourself, gee, uh, modern times, uh, when was the Odyssey written? And how is it that the poet thinks this is modern times? Uh, this class is uh, entitled Early World Literature. So uh, yes, as you might suspect, this poem was written hundreds of years ago. The Odyssey is a Greek epic poem dating from the end of the 8th century BC, so just over 2,800 years ago. However, the events described in it took place 400 years before that, so the Trojan War is traditionally set uh, 1,200 years uh, before Christ or before our modern era. Along with the Iliad, the Odyssey has been attributed to Homer and uh, scholars wonder who this Homer person was. Uh, is he a single poet? Uh, is he just a legendary author that they have this name and have, you know, associated uh, texts that are known, the Iliad and the Odyssey to him? Um, for sure, the poem circulated orally and was performed orally before it was written down. So with any pre-modern text, that often is the case, especially with um, with poetry. Uh, so there's often a gap between those two um acts of invention, so the uh, poetic uh, verbal performances and it being written down uh, for the historical record. What we have here is a collection of stories that surely circulated orally and you know, perhaps were not even part of one cohesive whole until Homer brought them together. So uh, it's been suggested that his name means something like the joiner, and it describes the, the practical function that he served. So uh, you'll see uh, Odysseus uh, mixed travels to various lands as he's trying to find his way home. So uh, to some extent, each of those might stand as a, a single story, uh, independent, uh, by itself. Here, here we have an image of Homer, a Roman copy after a Greek Hellenistic original. So uh, it's self-made several centuries after uh, Homer, whoever he was, lived. So what is the beginning of the story the poet has asked the muse uh, to help him, quote-unquote, find the beginning. As I've suggested, perhaps it's best to say the entry point, because even a story so simple as somebody's travel from uh, A to B can get very, very complicated. Well, what we hear about next in the poem 
is Zeus's complaint that mortals blame the gods for all of the bad things that happen to them. Let's consider just one example. Here is an example. We have a woman named Clytemnestra who has a lover named Aegisthus. While she is married to her husband, Agamemnon, who happens to be the brother of Menelaus, uh, the man married to Helen of Troy, who gets abducted by Paris. So these uh, Greek mythological stories get real complicated real fast. Uh, as you'll see, though, while there's many little soap operas uh, burrowed into this text uh, called the Odyssey, um, this one will uh, revisit the text over and over. And so it's worth uh, wrapping your brain around this love triangle. Among other things, Clytemnestra murders her husband Agamemnon in his bathtub uh, upon his return home from the Trojan War. Uh, she has taken this lover, Aegisthus, uh, because she is angry at her husband Agamemnon, who's been off at war. Uh, among other things, he sacrificed their the daughter that they shared, uh, Iphigenia, uh, earlier in the um, earlier in the narrative. Uh, in order to propitiate the gods to get uh, the winds to blow so that their ships would would sail. Uh, so she's, you know, before we judge Clytemnestra too much, uh, she's pretty steamed about that. Um, but if you think, yeah, that's a terrible thing that she and her lover did um, to her husband, don't worry. Agamemnon's son, Orestes, avenges his father's murder uh, and Orestes, there's a name that you'll hear again in this um, text, even though it's not part of the, the main, main plot. Uh, this story, to a great degree, involves the relationship between a father and his son. Uh, and so Orestes and Agamemnon's relationship gets brought up uh, quite a few times. Once we launch into the poem and the poet says to the muse, uh, show me the beginning, uh, we hear about Zeus complaining about things that humans do to jack up their lives and blame the gods. Uh, so if we pull back and think, you know, and in terms of the big picture, you know, why kick off the story of Odysseus's homecoming uh, with this complaint on the part of Zeus? Uh, we, the audience, are supposed to wonder, um, you know, who governs human affairs, the gods or the humans themselves? So we've already heard one example of the gods intervening in Odysseus's homecoming. So the sun god is angry that his men have eaten his cattle. So we might recast this question, are human lives real or fabricated? So are humans, do they have free will to frame it in a, a different kind of way? Or are they just the pawns and the playthings of the, the gods? And, you know, by extension, are these humans whom we hear about in this book, are they leading real lives or are they leading scripted lives just for our amusement so by beginning the poem this way we get insight into the poem's subject uh yes it is about a homecoming but we are also going to learn about the relationship between humans and deities we get a response to zeus's complaint from his daughter athena the goddess of wisdom who sprang uh, fully formed out of Zeus's own head. Uh, this is what Athena has to say. So she turns her attention to Odysseus. What about him and uh, the suffering that he is enduring right now? Um, a little bit of backstory on Athena because uh, she becomes very important to the Odyssey. Uh, even in book one, um, she takes on a disguise as an old man named Mentes in order to put a bug in the ear of Odysseus's son named Telemachus. So she feels like she's got some skin in the game. And why is this? Uh, she herself is single. Uh, she's a virgin goddess. She doesn't have romantic relationships per se. Um, all of the other gods and goddesses, or many of them, it's... Um, 
you know, hard to keep score uh, with all of the relationships that happen um, between them and between the gods and and mortals. Uh, but she's got a bit of a soft spot for Odysseus, even maybe a crush. So notice this when the two of them um, have some scenes together. She uh, herself is the goddess of wisdom, among other things. Uh, she's also one of her attributes is uh, being good at, at battle. There we see her uh, with a, a a weapon and that is supposed to be Odysseus uh, in this fun little cartoon she's he's wearing uh, some kind of Greek looking garb and she's saying there there it's okay um, as you will see he's very crafty so he's the one who came up with the idea for the Trojan horse uh, and you know, sometimes he stretches the truth and even you know flat out lies in order to get out of certain situations I'm not sure if I'm dating myself or if you guys will be at all familiar with the 1980s uh, television character called MacGyver. Uh, I relate Odysseus to this uh, character because Odysseus is resourceful. So as this show went, it was like an action adventure slash crime show. Uh, and the title character MacGyver could figure out how to get out of any situation so he could make you know, pick a lock with a, uh, a paper clip, you know, that would be the least of the, you know, types of feats that he'd be able to, um, pull off. Uh, so that was a joke during the eighties, you know, give him a, um, you know, bag of apples or something, and he could make a bomb out of it and, uh, to escape from prison or something. Uh, like MacGyver, Odysseus is able to get out of a lot of sti sticky situations. Uh, we know that he's a good warrior, but he can also think and uh, talk and scheme uh, and connive his way out of any jam. Uh, so I think that the text you know, asks us to wonder, you know, in these situations, is he just doing what he needs to do to stay alive? Uh, or is he you know, a trickster figure and a liar, as well as a thief and an adulterer? So you know, do we think he's just being crafty and resourceful and making the most of the situation that he's put in? Um, as you'll see, he's, you know, not just a stock hero who is, you know, a warrior returning home from uh, the Trojan War. Uh, he really is a psychologically complicated man, as the poet tells us. In response to Zeus's complaint about the humans, uh, Athena brings up her special human whom she loves the best Odysseus and discloses a plan part one of the plan get Hermes the messenger god to get Calypso to release Odysseus uh, so Calypso is a very beautiful goddess uh, but Odysseus you know as we learn he feels you're stranded on this island where you know he you know, could have become her husband. Uh, she brags that she's more beautiful than any mortal woman, including his wife. Uh, so you know, why doesn't he want to stay there? And he's in something of a holding pattern for uh, the, the better part of a decade, which is maybe how some of us feel uh, in different points of our lives. Part two of the plan. She will talk to Telemachus, Odysseus's son. She will be disguised as an old man named Mentes. So we can see in that word, the modern day English word mentor. So she's you know, going to be like an older and wiser figure and put a bug in his ear. So I'm reading from page 111, book one, lines 194 to eight. Uh, she gives Telemachus a bit of hope. Uh, she says that she's been traveling, uh, she's parked her ship, but of course she's in the persona of this um, old man and says, I came because they told me your father was here, but now it seems that gods have blocked his path back home. But I am sure he's not yet dead. The wide sea keeps him trapped upon some island, captured by fierce men who will not let him go. Uh, of course we know that it's the uh, beautiful witch uh, Calypso who has him trapped uh, at this current moment in, in time. And she's hoping to uh, enlist the help of the god Mercury slash Hermes to spring him from Calypso's island. Uh, but you know, she 
circulates here a bit of a false rumor, um, stretches the truth a bit in order to give Telemachus a bit of hope about what she in fact knows. What is Telemachus's story? We know that Odysseus has an interesting story, but by virtue of his complicated story, other people's lives are complicated. So Telemachus, his father, Odysseus, left for the Trojan War when Telemachus was just a baby. So now he is a young adult, a college-age student, uh, 20 years old. In addition to missing his father and wondering if he is still alive, Telemachus has more immediate problems that he's currently dealing with, and he unloads about these to his friend Mentes. So what is this problem that Telemachus has? Well, he has a house full of suitors who are hoping to wed his mother, Penelope. They are drinking and eating and having sex nonstop right there in his father's palace. I'm going to read Athena's response to his rant. So it's on page 113 of your text. This is book one, lines 252 through 268. Athena said in outrage, this is monstrous. You need Odysseus to come back home and lay his hands on all those shameless suitors. If only he would come here now and stand right at the gates with two spears in his hands, in shield and helmet, as when I first saw him. Odysseus was visiting our house, drinking and having fun on his way back from sailing in swift ships to Athera to visit Ilus. He had gone there looking for deadly poison to anoint his arrows. Illus refused because he feared the gods. My father gave Odysseus the poison, loving him blindly. May Odysseus come meet the suitors with that urge to kill. A bitter courtship and short life for them. But whether he comes home to take revenge or not is with the gods. You must consider how best to drive these suitors from your house. And that went to line 270. My apologies. Uh, but what is she saying there? She's giving him some practical advice as well as telling a little little white lie. She's gotten into the role of mentees uh, and says she's encountered Odysseus uh, while on an errand earlier in his uh, in his life and explains how he was good at dispatching uh, dispatching vengeance. Uh, you know, what's at the essence of her remark here to Telemachus is the distinction between divine matters and mortal matters. So she's said that, you know, the gods will deal with uh, Odysseus, and that's up to them whether he makes it home. You have practical things right in front of you that you have to deal with. Um, you know, and thus we might see it's, you know, not an exact analogy, but the difference between literature and real life. So uh, literature is something that's, you know, prescripted uh, stories that are, you know, out of our control. Uh, they've been written by somebody else. But, you know, real life, we might look to literature as some kind of, you know, guide for the way that we act. But ultimately, we do have real practical decisions in, in front of us. So uh, although Odysseus's story is beyond Telemachus's control, uh, a Telemachus has something to do right there, and that is to clean house. And hence, he will be like his father Odysseus, who acquired the poison in order to exact revenge um so thus we see in her remarks the difference between divine and mortal matters telemachus uh, has control over how he deals with the suitors um you know if we kind of worry a little bit at what she said to him like she's a deity telling him that he has control like of course we know that the gods uh have tossed odysseus around a bit and because his uh, men ate the cattle of the sun god, uh, ex uh, divine revenge has been exacted upon him. So, um, you know, 
moments in the text where we feel like, okay, these humans are really taking action and uh, pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and they have a plan and they're putting it into action. Uh, you, then we'll see you know, the gods intervene in some kind of way. So I really like the intersection between uh, human activity and divine intervention in this text. It's um, really interesting and it makes us wonder, uh, you know, are we all just in a your big book or a script that you know somebody else has uh, has written, and we're just characters who don't have control over our our destiny. Uh, Telemachus realizes if we pay close attention in book one, uh, there are a couple of references to his recognition that she is not a human. She's not the man named Mentes. Uh, in fact, she is divine. So. At the end of this uh, passage, watching her go, Telemachus thinks to himself, he was amazed and saw she was a god. So once again, there's this tension during that you know, exchange that he has with Mentes. Um, at what point you know, does he realize that he was talking to a deity and getting some, you know, really extra special advice and in fact advice that, you know, isn't just between two men or between two humans, but in fact, uh, one of the gods is whispering into his ear about uh, how he should get rid of the suitors, you know, and uh, that his dad is still alive, although he has not yet come home. So let's get the third major character on deck. We know about Odysseus, the father and the husband. We have met Telemachus, the son of Odysseus and Penelope. And last but not least, we meet the mother slash wife, Penelope. So what is her story? She is Odysseus's wife, who's now been awaiting his return for the better part of 20 years for several years, uh, it's less than a handful of years at this point, I think it's three years, the text tells us, uh, the suitors have been freeloading at Odysseus's house, waiting for her to choose one of them as her uh, next husband, assuming that Odysseus is dead. When we meet Penelope, we are asked immediately as the audience for this poem to once again think about the relationship between life and art, uh, she tells the poet Phemius to shut up, and you'll see why uh, that scene uh, pertains to the relationship between life and art. So I'm looking at page 115, uh, line 326, onto page 116, um, where we get Penelope's reaction to the poet singing. They were sitting calmly, so that's the, the suitors listening to the poet who sang how Athena cursed the journey of the Greeks as they were sailing home from Troy. Upstairs, Penelope had heard the marvelous song. She clambered down the steep steps of her house. Not by herself, two slave girls came with her. She reached the suitors looking like a goddess, then stopped and stood beside a sturdy pillar, holding a gauzy veil before her face. Her slave girl stood, one on each side of her, in tears, she told the holy singer, Stop, please, Phemius, you know so many songs, enchanting tales of things that gods and men have done, the deeds that singers publicize. Sing something else and let them drink in peace. Stop this upsetting song that always breaks my heart so I can barely, hardly bear my grief. I miss him all the time, that man, my husband, whose story is so famous throughout Greece. So, uh, recap, we have the poet who's singing about the aftermath of the Trojan War, which is mythological, although in the Western imagination, it seems like it's something that actually um, happened, but uh, the abduction of Helen of Troy and all of that is um, just uh, traditional stories, mythological stories, but not actual history. Um, but yet it's real for Penelope. Um, she's heard these songs about her husband before, and it's like her wounds are being dug, you know, all afresh by the poet's um, songs. It's really hitting her where it hurts, so to speak. Um, so once again, we're encouraged to ask the question, does literature represent reality or create it? So 
um, you know, it's all too real for her. Like she's kind of living there in ground zero, so to speak, um, at this moment, because she's waiting for one of the most storied heroes from the Trojan War to make it back home. Uh, and there she's, you know, in the aftermath in her empty house with all of these uh, you know, men who are you know, vying to take the place of her of her husband. So Telemachus um, is rather rude to his mother, I'd say, throughout the text, and here in particular, he tells her, you know, quiet, poets are not to blame for how things are, Zeus is. Um, so we're right back at the beginning of this book, because Zeus has said, oh, oh, you know, why is it humans blame us for their problems? So while Penelope would say the poet needs to be quiet, uh, Telemachus would say, no, it's, you know, Zeus hurling his thunderbolts that causes um, our problems. Like, let the poet tell his, uh, tell his story. Um, and he tells her to resume her work. So question, what is her work? So what is Penelope's work? As you can see there, she's weaving at a loom while they are partying in the background. She has told the suitors that she will choose one of them once she's done weaving a funeral shroud for her father-in-law, Laertes, whom you will meet in the text. So um, given that this first book of the Odyssey has been concerned with the work that literature does and its relationship with quote-unquote reality, um, I find it interesting that her art doesn't just commemorate her dead father-in-law, who's in fact still alive um it manipulates reality so she's buying some time and feeding the suitors with this um fake story uh and in doing so quote unquote keeping her husband alive uh, because she doesn't have to choose one of them so long as she's weaving this shroud um as you uh, know from the text every night she would set to undoing the work that she had done during the day uh, so that this becomes a never ending task that she's just savoring because she doesn't want to have to choose one of them. And of course she wants to, uh, she wants to resume life with her husband. Uh, so yeah, really her spinning that uh, funeral shroud, you know, is a supremely you know, hopeful gesture. Uh, but then to, entertain our question once again about the relationship between literature and weaving. Um, this is a conceit that is abundant in art and in culture. Uh, you're perhaps familiar with the turn of phrase that somebody spins yarn when they tell a story, um, or you might say about an essay that you're wrapping it up or that the threads of your argument are coming together. Uh, so there's all kinds of weaving analogies associated with um, writing and storytelling that uh, this text is attuned to. Uh, and with that, that does it for lecture number one. Congratulations. Uh, we'll see you over the Zoom in class.